to take just a few minutes and look at the history of the U.S. prison system. The reason I want to do this is to demonstrate that this dual role of corrections is not some new progressive idea that is being pushed on us all of a sudden. A focus on the life change part of this, the rehabilitation, the reformation of the inmate has always been at the forefront of the U.S. correction system, even from its very inception. Let's take a quick look at the timeline of prisons and the reform efforts within this country. In the colonial days of our country, we didn't have a prison system. If people broke the law, they were held in jail or in stocks long enough to determine their guilt. And then if guilty, corporal punishment was swift and public. Either the person was put to death or they were beaten or humiliated some way publicly. We credit the Quakers in the early 1800s to call for a different system. They reacted against the death sentences and public beatings and humiliation, and they desired to create a place kind of similar to a monastery where people could come and experience repentance for what they've done and change their lives and change their behaviors. So thus the era of incarceration was born. The Quakers' expectation was unrealized, unfortunately, and the prison setting quickly devolved into rampant disorder. Escapes and riots were common, harsh treatment from the staff became commonplace, and the solitude and silence that was supposed to evoke repentance actually was just idleness on the inmates' hands and became the mother of crime where they could dream up bigger ways to engage in criminal activity. Overcrowding became a problem fairly quickly, and the staff became cynical about the idea of reform of the inmates. Okay, so let's fast forward about 50 years to a report by two men, the Wise and Dwight Report from 1871. These two men visited prisons in 18 states and into Canada, and they produced 70 bound volumes of documents from their visits. They gave a forceful call for reform. Some of the things that this report cited was a lack of staff training, cruel and degrading treatment, and they made this statement that not one state prison is seeking reformation as a goal, nor deploying efficient means to pursue reformation. This call for reform led to the creation of what is now the American Correctional Association. And one of those leading voices, Zebulon Brockway, made this statement during that time. Let us leave behind the thought of inflicting punishment as so-called justice and turn toward the two grand divisions of our subject, protection of society by prevention of crime and reformation of criminals. Unfortunately, in 20 years, Brockway's own prison did not live up to its promises. The prison reforms that he espoused didn't even take root in his own facility. The failure was mainly due to excessive brutality and overcrowding. So now let's fast forward another 50 years to early 20th century around the time of World War I and World War II. During this time, there was a new reliance on behavioral sciences for correction of deviant behavior, a new emphasis on the psychotherapeutic model, medical model, and education became common. Now, various models were initiated in this era, yet nothing was really sustained. And some of the reasons for that failure and the slide back into the punitive model include overcrowding, overran caseloads, staff disputes, such as between security versus programming staff, and political pressure to emphasize punishment over treatment. So now let's fast forward another 50 years to the time of President Johnson's Crime Commission Report. This commission examined our state prisons and determined that as a whole, they were barren and futile, brutal and degrading. And rather than correcting deviant behavior, they were reinforcing manipulation and destructiveness. As a result of this report, there was a good bit of political support in the call for reform. The Bureau of Prisons announced its plan for the Metropolitan Correctional Complex and that this would be a radical departure from previous prison models. But before the MCC model could even get going, the enthusiasm was quickly dampened by the work of a now famous sociologist named Robert Martison. 
Martison claimed that his research pointed to the fact that prison programming was basically ineffective. He went on an episode of 60 Minutes and made his declaration, and the concept of rehabilitation was deemed a myth. The nothing works mentality won the day. Budgets were slashed. Many political leaders were no longer encouraged to invest funds into anything beyond the lock and feed model and corrections. It's worth noting that other researchers pushed back on Martison's conclusions, and Martison himself came back and renounced his statement, but it was too late. The nothing works mentality was embedded. And soon after that, we enter into the tough on crime and war on drugs era that led to mass incarceration. Overcrowding problems and strained budgets further diminished any hope of significant prison reform. But it's not all gloom and doom. There are success stories of effective reform in other countries and in pockets of our own country. And we are equipped with better understanding of why our workforce tends to default to that negative punitive mindset to begin with. Our values-based wellness plan begins to uncover the brain science of why this job will change you. And now we can establish interventions and practices that will result in better outcomes. In addition though, we must articulate a clear vision for what we do. We offer to you this clear vision must be public safety. In corrections, we play a role in public safety, a true role in delivering public safety, but it's often misunderstood. A lot of people, when they think about prison or corrections, they think public safety and they think about bars and people being confined, and that is public safety. You can't argue that that is public safety, but that's only one of the ways corrections has a significant role in public safety. The more significant and really the more difficult role we have in delivering public safety is by helping those that are incarcerated correct their behavior offer the programming and the rehabilitative tools that can help that individual make changes in their lives if they choose to. So I think it's twofold. I think we have sort of the security responsibility, the monitoring in the community, um, security in the prison, but I think our obligation is also to affect opportunities, to provide opportunities for, for people to take a different path at the end of their sentence. The purpose of the um, uh, adult correction system is to take broken people and make them whole. Um, we're not punishers. The responsibility to punish is a function giving to our judicial branch. We're responsible for carrying out the mandates of the court and one of the mandates of the court is not just to hold someone for a finite period of time but to give them tools to rehabilitate themselves during that uh, sentence of incarceration and that duty to rehabilitate is what modern day corrections is really about. Well the, the textbook answer is certainly you know retribution, incapacitation, deterrence, rehabilitation, restoration and uh, all those components are important but I think I think too often we in the in the profession you know view ourselves as, uh, as we take pride in protecting the public but we we view our role in that as doing so during the period of incapacitation. And that's important. I mean, we, we perform a very important function keeping dangerous uh, people from, the, from society. But I think too often we don't realize or, or take into account that over 90% of those are, are gonna be released someday. So we have a tremendous responsibility to make a positive impact during the time they're with us to not only reduce recidivism and ensure that the folks that get out of prison don't come back, but by doing that, we reduce future victimization. You know, I remember when that transition in my thinking occurred, and I think that's, a, that's just tremendously important that our officers understand that and, and view them, their public safety role as going beyond the time that we uh, have individuals in our custody. So I think the correction system in this country has long been something that has been neglected and has not, not lived up to its true potential but that's changing. To me, the fundamental question is, what's the purpose of a prison? And to me, it's only two things. It's to protect, and it is to transform. There is a dual role of public safety and corrections, and it's always been the case. Safe and secure facilities, keeping those off the streets who have been a danger to society, 
upholding justice by ensuring that sentence is served, and providing help needed in an atmosphere that encourages rehabilitation in hopes of preventing future victims of crime. This requires a courageous, highly skilled workforce using a multidisciplinary approach with evidence-based practices in an environment conducive to positive pro-social change. Our correctional staff must work together for this common vision. Every treatment staff member has to be security-minded, and every security staff member must also be rehabilitative-minded. We don't practice beyond our scope, but we cooperate in a multidisciplinary fashion to accomplish the goal of public safety. And there will always be overlaps, such as with de-escalation training or crisis intervention. And the greater those areas of overlap, the more professional our workforce becomes.